with the old breed, disc four. Rumor had it, as we dug in, that the division had suffered heavy casualties in the landing and subsequent fighting. The veterans I knew said it had been about the worst day of fighting they had ever seen. Casualty figures for the 1st Marine Division on D-Day reflected the severity of the fighting and the ferocity of the Japanese defense. The division staff had predicted D-Day losses of 500 casualties, but the total figure was 1,111 killed and wounded, not including heat prostration cases. It was an immense relief to me when we got our gun pit completed and had registered in our gun by firing two or three rounds of HE into an area out in front of Company K. My thirst was almost unbearable. My stomach was tied in knots, and sweat soaked me. Dissolving some K-ration dextrose tablets in my mouth helped, and I took the last sip of my dwindling water supply. We had no idea when relief would get through with additional water. Artillery shells shrieked and whistled back and forth overhead with increasing frequency, and small arms fire rattled everywhere. In the eerie green light of star shells swinging pendulum-like on their parachutes so that shadows danced and swayed around crazily, I started taking off my right shoe. Sledgehammer, what the hell are you doing? Snafu asked in an exasperated tone. Taking off my boondockers, my feet hurt, I replied. Have you gone Asiatic? he asked excitedly. What the hell are you going to do in your stocking feet if the nips come busting out of that jungle or across this field? We may have to get out of this hole and haul tail if we're ordered to. They're probably going to pull a bonsai before daybreak, and how do you reckon you'll move around on this coral in your stockings? I said that I just wasn't thinking. He reamed me out good and told me we would be lucky to get our shoes off before the island was secured. I thanked God my foxhole buddy was a combat veteran. Snafu then nonchalantly drew his K-bar and stuck it in the coral gravel near his right hand. My stomach tightened and goose flesh chilled my back and shoulders at the sight of the long blade in the greenish light and the realization of why he placed it within such easy reach. He then checked his forty-five automatic pistol. I followed his example with my K-bar as I crouched on the other side of the mortar, checked my carbine, and looked over the mortar shells, H-E and flares, stacked up within reach. We settled down for the long night. Is that theirs or ours, Snafu? I asked each time a shell went over. There was nothing subtle or intimate about the approach and explosion of an artillery shell. When I heard the whistle of an approaching one in the distance, every muscle in my body contracted. I braced myself in a puny effort to keep from being swept away. I felt utterly helpless. As the fiendish whistle grew louder, my teeth ground against each other, my heart pounded, my mouth dried, my eyes narrowed, sweat poured over me, my breath came in short, irregular gasps and I was afraid to swallow lest I choke. I always prayed, sometimes out loud. Under certain conditions of range and terrain, I could hear the shell approaching from a considerable distance, thus prolonging the suspense into seemingly unending torture. At the instant the voice of the shell grew the loudest, it terminated in a flash and a deafening explosion similar to the crash of a loud clap of thunder. The ground shook, and the concussion hurt my ears. Shell fragments tore the air apart as they rushed out, whirring and ripping. Rocks and dirt clattered onto the deck as smoke of the exploded shell dissipated. To be under a barrage or prolonged shelling simply magnified all the terrible physical and emotional effects of one shell. To me, Artillery was an invention of hell. The onrushing whistle and scream of the big steel package of destruction 
was the pinnacle of violent fury and the embodiment of pent-up evil. It was the essence of violence and of man's inhumanity to man. I developed a passionate hatred for shells. To be killed by a bullet seemed so clean and surgical, but shells would not only tear and rip the body, they tortured one's mind almost beyond the brink of sanity. After each shell I was wrung out, limp and exhausted. During prolonged shelling, I often had to restrain myself and fight back a wild, inexorable urge to scream, to sob, and to cry. As Peleliu dragged on, I feared that if I ever lost control of myself under shell fire, my mind would be shattered. I hated shells, as much for their damage to the mind as to the body. To be under heavy shell fire was, to me, by far the most terrifying of combat experiences. Each time it left me feeling more forlorn and helpless, more fatalistic, and with less confidence that I could escape the dreadful law of averages that inexorably reduced our numbers. Fear is many-faceted and has many subtle nuances, but the terror and desperation endured under heavy shelling are by far the most unbearable. The night wore on endlessly, and I was hardly able to catch even so much as a catnap. Toward the pre-dawn hours, numerous enemy artillery pieces concentrated their fire on the area of scrub jungle from which Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Walt had brought us. The shells screeched and whined over us and crashed beyond in the scrub. Whoo, boy, listen to them nip gunners plaster that area, said a buddy in the next hall. Yeah, Snafu said. They must think we're still out there, and I bet you they'll counterattack right across through that place, too. Thank God we are here and not out there, our buddy said. The barrage increased in tempo as the Japanese gave the vacant scrub jungle a real pounding. When the barrage finally subsided, I heard someone say with a chuckle, Ah, uh, don't knock it off now, you bastards. Fire all your goddamn shells out there in the wrong place. Don't worry, knucklehead. They'll have plenty left to fire in the right place, which is going to be where they see us when daylight comes, another voice said. Supplies had been slow in keeping up with the needs of the 5th Marines infantry companies on D-Day. The Japanese kept heavy artillery, mortar, and machine gun fire on the entire regimental beach throughout the day. Enemy artillery and mortar observers called down their fire on amphibian vehicles as soon as they reached the beach. This made it difficult to get the critical supplies ashore and the wounded evacuated. All of Peleliu was a front line on D-Day. No one but the dead was out of reach of enemy fire. The shore party people did their best, but they couldn't make up for the heavy losses of Amtrak's needed to bring the supplies to us. The shore party battalion consisted of Marines assigned the mission of unloading and handling supplies and of directing logistics traffic on the beach during an amphibious assault. We weren't aware of the problems on the beach, being too occupied with our own. We griped, cursed, and prayed that water would get to us. I had used mine more sparingly than some men had, but I finally emptied both of my canteens by the time we finished the gun pit. Dissolving dextrose tablets in my mouth helped a little, but my thirst grew worse through the night. For the first time in my life, I appreciated fully the motion picture cliché of a man on a desert crying, Water! Water! Artillery shells still passed back and forth overhead just before dawn, but there wasn't much small arms fire in our area. Abruptly there swept over us some of the most intense Japanese machine gun fire I ever saw concentrated in such a small area. Tracers streaked and bullets cracked not more than a foot over the top of our gun pit. We lay flat on our backs and waited as the burst ended. The gun cut loose again, joined by a second and possibly a third. 
streams of bluish-white tracers, American tracers were red, poured thickly overhead, apparently coming from somewhere near the airfield. The crossfire kept up for at least a quarter of an hour. They really poured it on. Shortly before the machine guns opened fire, we had received word to move out at daylight with the entire 5th Marine Regiment in an attack across the airfield. I prayed the machine gun fire would subside before we had to move out. We were pinned down tightly. To raise anything above the edge of the gun pit would have resulted in its being cut off as though by a giant scythe. After about fifteen minutes, firing ceased abruptly. We sighed in relief. D plus one. Dawn finally came, and with it, the temperature rose rapidly. Where the hell is our water? growled men around me. We had suffered many cases of heat prostration the day before and needed water, or we'd all pass out during the attack, I thought. Stand by to move out, came the order. We squared away all of our personal gear. Snafu secured the gun and took it down by folding the bipod and strapping it, while I packed my remaining shells in my ammo bag. I've got to get some water, or I'm going to crack up. I said. At that moment, a buddy nearby yelled and beckoned to us. Come on, we found a well. I snatched up my carbine and took off, empty canteens bouncing on my cartridge belt. About twenty-five yards away, a group of company K men gathered at a hole about fifteen feet in diameter and ten feet deep. I peered over the edge. At the bottom and to one side, was a small pool of milky-looking water. Japanese shells were beginning to fall on the airfield, but I was too thirsty to care. One of the men was already in the hole, filling canteens and passing them up. The buddy who had called me was drinking from a helmet with its liner removed. He gulped down the milky stuff and said, "'It isn't beer, but it's wet.' Helmets and canteens were passed up to those of us waiting." "'Don't bunch up, you guys. We'll draw a Jap fire sure as hell,' shouted one man. The first man who drank the water looked at me and said, "'I feel sick.' A company corpsman came up, yelling, "'Don't drink that water, you guys. It may be poisoned.' I had just lifted a full helmet to my lips when the man next to me fell, holding his sides and retching violently. I threw down my water, milky with coral dust, and started assisting the corpsman with the man who was ill. He went to the rear, where he recovered. Whether it was poison or pollution, we never knew. "'Get your gear on and stand by,' someone yelled. Frustrated and angry, I headed back to the gun pit. A detail came up about that time with water cans, ammo, and rations. A friend and I helped each other pour water out of a five-gallon can into our canteen cups. Our hands shook. We were so eager to quench our thirst. I was amazed that the water looked brown in my aluminum canteen cup. No matter, I took a big gulp and almost spit it out, despite my terrible thirst. It was awful, full of rust and oil. It stunk. I looked into the cup in disbelief as a blue film of oil floated lazily on the surface of the smelly brown liquid cramps gripped the pit of my stomach. My friend looked up from his cup and groaned. Sledgehammer, are you thinking what I'm thinking? I sure am. That oil drum steam cleaning detail on Pavuvu, I said wearily. We had been together on a detail assigned to clean out the drums. I'm a son of a bitch, he growled. I'll never goof off on another work party as long as I live. I told him I didn't think it was our fault. We weren't the only ones assigned to the detail, and it was obvious to us from the start, if not to some supply officer, that the method we had been ordered to use didn't really clean the drums. But that knowledge was slight consolation out there on the Peladu airfield in the increasing heat. As awful as the stuff was, we had to drink it or suffer heat exhaustion. 
After I drained my cup, a residue of rust resembling coffee grounds remained, and my stomach ached. We picked up our gear and prepared to move out in preparation for the attack across the airfield. Because three fives line during the night faced south and was back to back with that of two five, we had to move to the right and prepare to attack northward across the airfield with the other battalions of the regiment. The Japanese shelling of our lines began at daylight, so we had to move out fast and in dispersed formation. We finally got into position for the attack and were told to hit the deck until ordered to move again. This suited me fine, because the Japanese shelling was getting worse. Our artillery, ships, and planes were laying down a terrific amount of fire in front of the airfield and ridges beyond, in preparation for our attack. Our pre-attack barrage lasted about half an hour. I knew we would move out when it ended. As I lay on the blistering hot coral and looked across the open airfield, heat waves shimmered and danced, distorting the view of Bloody Nose Ridge. A hot wind blew in our faces. An NCO hurried by, crouching low and yelling, Keep moving out there, you guys. There's less chance you'll be hit if you go across fast and don't stop. Let's go, shouted an officer who waved toward the airfield. We moved at a walk, then a trot, in widely dispersed waves. Four infantry battalions, from left to right, 2-1, 1-5, 2-5, 3-5—this put us on the edge of the airfield—moved across the open, fire-swept airfield. My only concern then was my duty and survival, not panoramic combat scenes. But I often wondered later what that attack looked like to aerial observers and to those not immersed in the firestorms. All I was aware of were the small area immediately around me and the deafening noise. Bloody Nose Ridge dominated the entire airfield. The Japanese had concentrated their heavy weapons on high ground. These were directed from observation posts at elevations as high as 300 feet, from which they could look down on us as we advanced. I could see men moving ahead of my squad, but I didn't know whether our battalion, 3-5, was moving across behind 2-5 and then wheeling to the right. There were also men about 20 yards to our rear. We moved rapidly in the open, amid craters and coral rubble, through ever-increasing enemy fire. I saw men to my right and left running bent as low as possible. The shells screeched and whistled, exploding all around us. In many respects it was more terrifying than the landing, because there were no vehicles to carry us along, not even the thin steel sides of an Amtrak for protection. We were exposed, running on our own power through a veritable shower of deadly metal and the constant crash of explosions. For me the attack resembled World War I movies I had seen of suicidal Allied infantry attacks through shell-fire on the Western Front. I clenched my teeth, squeezed my carbine stock, and recited over and over to myself, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. The sun bore down unmercifully, and the heat was exhausting. Smoke and dust from the barrage limited my vision. The ground seemed to sway back and forth under the concussions. I felt as though I were floating along in the vortex of some unreal thunderstorm. Japanese bullets snapped and cracked, and tracers went by me on both sides at waist height. This deadly small arms fire seemed almost insignificant amid the erupting shells. Explosions and the hum and the growl of shell fragments shredded the air. Chunks of blasted coral stung my face and hands, while steel fragments spattered down on the hard rock like hail on a city street. Everywhere shells flashed like giant firecrackers. 
Through the haze, I saw Marines stumble and pitch forward as they got hit. I then looked neither right nor left, but just straight to my front. The farther we went, the worse it got. The noise and concussion pressed in on my ears like a vice. I gritted my teeth and braced myself in anticipation of the shock of being struck down at any moment. It seemed impossible that any of us could make it across. We passed several craters that offered shelter, but I remembered the order to keep moving. Because of the superb discipline and excellent esprit of the Marines, it had never occurred to us that the attack might fail. About halfway across, I stumbled and fell forward. At that instant, a large shell exploded to my left with a flash and a roar. A fragment ricocheted off the deck and growled over my head as I went down. On my right, Snafu let out a grunt and fell as the fragment struck him. As he went down, he grabbed his left side. I crawled quickly to him. Fortunately, the fragment had spent much of its force and luckily hit against Snafu's heavy web pistol belt. The threads on the broad belt were frayed in about an inch square area. I knelt beside him, and we checked his side. He had only a bruise to show for his incredible luck. On the deck I saw the chunk of steel that had hit him. It was about an inch square and a half inch thick. I picked up the fragment and showed it to him. Snafu motioned toward his pack. Terrified though I was amid the hellish chaos, I calmly juggled the fragment around in my hands. It was still hot, and dropped it into his pack. He yelled something that sounded dimly like, Let's go! I reached for the carrying strap of the mortar, but he pushed my hand away and lifted the gun to his shoulder. We got up and moved on as fast as we could. Finally we got across and caught up with other members of our company, who lay panting and sweating amid low bushes on the northeastern side of the airfield. How far we had come in the open I never knew, but it must have been several hundred yards. Everyone was visibly shaken by the thunderous barrage we had just come through. When I looked into the eyes of those fine Guadalcanal and Cape Gloucester veterans, some of America's best, I no longer felt ashamed of my trembling hands, and almost laughed at myself with relief. To be shelled by massed artillery and mortars is absolutely terrifying, but to be shelled in the open is terror compounded beyond the belief of anyone who hasn't experienced it. The attack across Peleliu's airfield was the worst combat experience I had during the entire war. It surpassed by the intensity of the blast and shock of the bursting shells, all the subsequent horrifying ordeals on Peleliu and Okinawa. The heat was incredibly intense. The temperature that day reached 105 degrees in the shade. We were not in the shade, and would soar to 115 degrees on subsequent days. Corman tagged numerous Marines with heat prostration as being too weak to continue. We evacuated them. My boondockers were so full of sweat that my feet felt squishy when I walked. Lying on my back, I held up first one foot and then the other. Water literally poured out of each shoe. "'Hey, sledgehammer!' chuckled a man sprawled next to me. "'You've been walking on water!' Maybe that's why he didn't get hit coming across that airfield, laughed another. I tried to grin and was glad the inevitable wisecracks had started up again. Because of the shape of the airfield, 3-5 was pinched out of the line by 2-5 on our left and 3-7 on our right after our crossing. We swung eastward and Company K tied in with 3-7, which was attacking in the swampy areas on the eastern side of the airfield. As we picked up our gear, a veteran remarked to me with a jerk of his head toward the airfield where the shelling continued. That was rough duty. Hate to have to do that every day. We moved through the swamps amid sniper fire and dug in for the night with our backs to the sea. I positioned my mortar in a meager gun pit on a slight rise of ground about fifteen feet from a sheer rock bluff 
that dropped about ten feet to the ocean. The jungle growth was extremely thick, but we had a clear hole in the jungle canopy above the gun pit through which we could fire the mortar without having shells hit the foliage and explode. Most of the men in the company were out of sight through the thick mangroves. Still short of water, everyone was weakened by the heat and the exertions of the day. I had used my water as sparingly as possible and had to eat twelve salt tablets that day. We kept close count of these tablets. They caused retching if we took more than necessary. The enemy infiltration that followed was a nightmare. Illumination fired above the airfield the previous night, D-Day, had discouraged infiltration in my sector, but others had experienced plenty of the hellish sort of thing we now faced and would suffer every night for the remainder of our time on Peleliu. The Japanese were noted for their infiltration tactics. On Peleliu they refined them and practiced them at a level of intensity not seen in the past. After we had dug in late that afternoon, we followed a procedure used nearly every night. Using directions from our observer, we registered in the mortar by firing a couple of HE shells into a defilade or some similar avenue of approach in front of the company, not covered by our machine gun or rifle fire, where the enemy might advance. We then set up alternate aiming stakes to mark other terrain features on which we could fire. Everyone lighted up a smoke, and the password for the night was whispered along the line, passed from foxhole to foxhole. The password always contained the letter L, which the Japanese had difficulty pronouncing the way an American would. Word came along as to the disposition of the platoons of the company and of the units on our flanks. We checked our weapons and placed equipment for quick access in the coming night. As darkness fell, the order was passed. The smoking lamp is out. All talking ceased. One man in each foxhole settled down as comfortably as he could to sleep on the jagged rock, while his buddy strained eyes and ears to detect any movement or sound in the darkness. An occasional Japanese mortar shell came into the area, but things were pretty quiet for a couple of hours. We threw up a few HE shells as harassing fire to discourage movement in front of the company. I could hear the sea lapping gently against the base of the rocks behind us. The Japanese soon began trying to infiltrate all over the company front and along the shore to our rear. We heard sporadic bursts of small arms fire and the bang of grenades. Our fire discipline had to be strict in such situations so as not to mistakenly shoot a fellow Marine. The loose accusation was often made during the war that Americans were trigger-happy at night and shot at anything that moved. This accusation was often correct when referring to rear area or inexperienced troops, but in the rifle companies it was also accepted as gospel that anybody who moved out of his hole at night without first informing the men around him and who didn't reply immediately with the password upon being challenged, could expect to get shot. Suddenly, movement in the dried vegetation toward the front of the gun pit got my attention. I turned cautiously around and waited, holding Snafu's Cock 45 automatic pistol at the ready. The rustling movements drew closer. My heart pounded. It was definitely not one of Peleliu's numerous land crabs that scuttled over the ground all night, every night. Someone was slowly crawling toward the gun pit. Then silence. More noise. Then silence. Rustling noises. Then silence. The typical pattern. It must be a Japanese trying to slip in as close as possible, stopping frequently to prevent detection, I thought. He probably had seen the muzzle flash when I fired the mortar. He would throw a grenade at any moment or jump me with his bayonet. I couldn't see a thing in the pale light and inky blackness of the shadows. Crouching low so as to see better any silhouette against the sky above me, I flipped off the thumb safety on the big pistol. 
A helmeted figure loomed up against the night sky in front of the gun pit. I couldn't tell from the silhouette whether the helmet was U.S. or Japanese. Aiming the automatic at the center of the head, I pressed the grip safety as I also squeezed the trigger slightly to take up the slack. The thought raced through my mind that he was too close to use his grenade, so he would probably use a bayonet or knife on me. My hand was steady even though I was scared. It was he or I. What's the password? I said in a low voice. No answer. Password, I demanded as my finger tightened on the trigger. The big pistol would fire and buck with recoil in a moment, but to hurry and jerk the trigger would mean a miss for sure. Then he'd be on me. S Sledgehammer, stammered the figure. I eased up on the trigger. It's Jay Delo. Jay Delo, you got any water? Jay, why didn't you give the password? I nearly shot you, I gasped. He saw the pistol and moaned. Oh, Jesus as he realized what had nearly happened. I thought you knew it was me, he said weakly. Jay was one of my closest friends. He was a Gloucester veteran and knew better than to prowl around the way he had just done. If my finger had applied the last bit of pressure to that trigger, Jay would have died instantly. It would have been his own fault, but that wouldn't have mattered to me. My life would have been ruined if I had killed him even under those circumstances. My right hand trembled violently as I lowered the big automatic. I had to flip on the thumb safety with my left hand. My right thumb was too weak. I felt nauseated and weak and wanted to cry. Jay crept over and sat on the edge of the gun pit. I'm sorry, Sledgehammer. I thought you knew it was me, he said. After handing him a canteen, I shuddered violently and thanked God that Jay was still alive. Just how in the hell could I tell it was you in the dark with nips all over the place? I snarled. Then I reamed out one of the best friends I ever had. Heading north. Get your gear on and stand by to move out. We shouldered our loads and began moving slowly out of the thick swamp. As I passed a shallow foxhole where Robert B. Oswalt had been dug in, I asked a man nearby if the word were true about Oswalt being killed. Sadly, he said yes. Oswalt had been fatally wounded in the head. A bright young mind that aspired to delve into the mysteries of the human brain to alleviate human suffering had itself been destroyed by a tiny chunk of metal. What a waste, I thought. War is such self-defeating, organized madness, the way it destroys a nation's best. I wondered also about the hopes and aspirations of a dead Japanese we had just dragged out of the water. But those of us caught up in the maelstrom of combat had little compassion for the enemy. As a wise, salty NCO had put it one day on Pavuvu, when asked by a replacement if he ever felt sorry for the Japanese when they got hit, Hell no, it's them or us. We moved out, keeping our five-pace interval through the thick swamp toward the sound of heavy firing. The heat was almost unbearable, and we were halted frequently to prevent heat prostration in the 115-degree temperature. We came to the eastern edge of the airfield and halted in the shade of a scrub thicket. Throwing down our gear, we fell on the deck, sweating, panting, exhausted. I had no more than reached for a canteen when a rifle bullet snapped overhead. "'He's close. Get down,' said an officer. The rifle cracked again. "'Sounds like he's right through there a little way,' the officer said. "'I'll get him,' said Howard Neese. Okay, go ahead, but watch yourself. Nice, a Gloucester veteran, grabbed his rifle and took off into the scrub with the nonchalance of a hunter going after a rabbit in a bush. He angled to one side so as to steal up on the sniper from the rear. We waited a few anxious moments, then heard two M1 shots. Old Howard got him. 
confidently remarked one of the men. Soon Howard reappeared wearing a triumphant grin and carrying a Japanese rifle and some personal effects. Everyone congratulated him on his skill, and he reacted with his usual modesty. Rack em up, boys, he laughed. We moved out in a few minutes through some knee-high bushes onto the open area at the edge of the airfield. The heat was terrific. When we halted again, we lay under the meager shade of the bushes. I held up each foot and let the sweat pour out of my boondockers. A man on the crew of the other weapon in our mortar section passed out. He was a Gloucester veteran, but Peleliu's heat proved too much for him. We evacuated him. But unlike some heat prostration cases, he never returned to the company. Some men pulled the rear border of their camouflaged helmet cover out from between the steel and the liner, so the cloth hung down over the backs of their necks. This gave them some protection against the blistering sun, but they looked like the French Foreign Legion in a desert. After a brief rest, we continued in dispersed order. We could see Bloody Nose Ridge to our left front. Northward from that particular area, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines, 2-1, was fighting desperately against Japanese hidden in well-protected caves. We were moving up to relieve 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, 1-5, and would tie in with the 1st Marines. Then we were to attack northward along the eastern side of the ridges. On this particular day, 17 September, the relief was slow and difficult. As 3-5 moved in and the men of 1-5 moved out, the Japanese in the ridges on our left front poured on the artillery and mortar fire. I pitied those tired men in 1-5 as they tried to extricate themselves without casualties. Their battalion, as with the others in the 5th Marines, had had a rough time crossing the airfield through the heavy fire the previous day. But once they got across, they met heavy resistance from pillboxes on the eastern side. We had been more fortunate. After getting across the airfield, three five moved into the swamp, which wasn't defended as heavily. With the relief of one five finally completed, we tied in with the first marines on our left and two five on our right. Our battalion was to attack during the afternoon through the low ground along the eastern side of Bloody Nose, while 2-5 was to clean out the jungle between our right flank and the eastern shore. As soon as we moved forward, we came under heavy flanking fire from Bloody Nose Ridge on our left. Snafu delivered his latest communique on the tactical situation to me as we hugged the deck for protection. They need to get some more damn troops up here, he growled. Our artillery was called in, but our mortars could fire only to the front of the company and not on the left flank area, because that was in the area of the 1st Marines. The Japanese observers on the ridge had a clear, unobstructed view of us. Their artillery shells whined and shrieked, accompanied by the deadly whispering of the mortar shells. Enemy fire grew more intense until we were pinned down. We were getting the first bitter taste of Bloody Nose Ridge, and we had increasing compassion for the first Marines on our left, who were battering squarely into it. The Japanese ceased firing when our movement stopped. Yet as surely as three men grouped together or anyone started moving, enemy mortars opened up on us. If a general movement occurred, their artillery joined in. The Japanese began to demonstrate the excellent fire discipline that was to characterize their use of all weapons on Peleliu. They fired only when they could expect to inflict maximum casualties, and stopped firing as soon as the opportunity passed. Thus our observers and planes had difficulty finding their well-camouflaged positions in the ridges. When the enemy ceased firing artillery and mortars from caves, they shut protective steel doors and waited, while our artillery, naval guns, and 81-millimeter mortars blasted away at the rock. If we moved ahead under our protective fire support, the Japanese pinned us down and inflicted serious losses on us, because it was almost impossible to dig a protective foxhole in the rock. 
No individual events of the attack stuck in my mind, just the severe fire from our left, and the feeling that at any time the Japanese decided to do so, they could have blown us sky high. Our attack was called off late in the afternoon, and we were ordered to set up our mortar for the night. An NCO came by and told me to go with him and about four others from other platoons to unload an Amtrak bringing up supplies for Company K. We arrived at the designated place, dispersed a little so as not to draw fire, and waited for the Amtrak. In a few minutes it came clanking up in a swirl of white dust. "'You guys from K Company, 5th Marines?' asked the driver. "'Yeah, you got chow and ammo for us?' asked our NCO. "'Yeah, sure have. Got a unit of fire, water, and rations. Better get it unloaded as soon as you can or we'll draw a fire.' the driver said as his machine lurched to a halt and he climbed down. Determined from experience, a unit of fire was the amount of ammunition that would last, on average, for one day of heavy fighting. A unit of fire for the M1 rifle was 100 rounds, for the carbine, 45 rounds, for the 45 caliber pistol, 14 rounds, for the light machine gun, 1,500 rounds, and for the 60-millimeter mortar, 100 rounds. The tractor was an older model, such as I had landed from on D-Day. It didn't have a drop tailgate, so we climbed aboard and hefted the heavy ammo boxes over the side and down onto the deck. Let's go, boys, our NCO said as he and a couple of us climbed onto the tractor. I saw him gaze in amazement down into the cargo area of the tractor. At the bottom, Wedged under a pile of ammo boxes, we saw one of those infernal 55-gallon oil drums of water. Filled, they weighed several hundred pounds. Our NCO rested his arms on the side of the tractor and remarked in an exasperated tone, It took a bloody genius of a supply officer to do that. How in the hell are we supposed to get that drum out of there? I don't know said the driver. I just bring it up. We cursed and began unloading the ammo as fast as possible. We had expected the water to be in several five-gallon cans, each of which weighed a little more than forty pounds. We worked as rapidly as possible, but then we heard that inevitable and deadly whoosh sh Three big mortar shells exploded, one after the other, not far from us. Uh Uh-oh, the stuff's hit the fan now, groaned one of my buddies. Bear a hand, you guys, on the double, said our NCO. Look, you guys, I'm going to have to get this tractor the hell out of here. If it gets knocked out and it's my fault, the lieutenant will have my can and a crack, groaned the driver. We had no gripe with the driver, and we didn't blame him. The Amtrak drivers on Peleliu were praised by everyone for doing such a fine job. Their bravery and sense of responsibility were above question. We worked like beavers, as our NCO said to him. I'm sorry, old buddy, but if we don't get these supplies unloaded, it's our ass. More mortar shells fell out to one side, and the fragments swished through the air. It was apparent that the Japanese mortar crew was trying to bracket us, but was afraid to fire too much for fear of being seen by our observers. We sweated and panted to get the ammo unloaded. We unloaded the water drum with a rope sling. "'You fellows need any help?' asked a Marine who appeared from the rear. We hadn't noticed him before he spoke. He wore green dungarees, leggings, and a cloth-covered helmet like ourselves, and carried a forty-five caliber automatic pistol like any mortar gunner, machine gunner, or one of our officers.' Of course, he wore no rank insignia being in combat. What astonished us was that he looked to be more than fifty years old and wore glasses, a rarity. For example, only two men in Company K wore them. When he took off his helmet to mop his brow, we saw his gray hair. Most men forward of division and regimental CPs were in their late teens or early twenties. Many officers were in their mid-twenties. When asked who he was and what unit he was in, he replied, 
Captain Paul Douglas, I was division adjutant until that barrage hit the 5th Marine CP yesterday. Then I was assigned as R1, personnel officer, in the 5th Regiment. I am very proud to be with the 5th Marines, he said. Gosh, Captain, you don't have to be up here at all, do you? asked one of our detail in disbelief as he passed ammo boxes to the fatherly officer. No, Douglas said. But I always want to know how you boys up here are making out, and I want to help if I can. What company you fellas from? From K Company, sir, I answered. His face lit up, and he said, Ah, you're in Andy Haldane's company. We asked Douglas if he knew Akak. He said yes, they were old friends. As we finished unloading, we all agreed that there wasn't a finer company commander than Captain Haldane. A couple more mortar shells crashed nearby. Our luck would run out soon. Japanese gunners usually got right on target. So we yelled, Shove off! to the driver. He waved and clanked away in his unloaded Amtrak. Captain Douglas helped us stack some of the ammo and told us we had better disperse. I heard a buddy ask, What's that crazy old gray-headed guy doing up here if he could be back at regiment? Our NCO growled, Shut up, knock it off, you eight ball. He's trying to help knuckleheads like you, and he's a damned good man. Paul Douglas became a legend in the 1st Marine Division. This remarkable man was 53 years old, had been an economics professor at the University of Chicago, and had enlisted in the Marine Corps as a private. In the Peleliu battle, he was slightly wounded, carrying flamethrower ammunition up to the lines. At Okinawa, he was wounded seriously by a bullet in the arm, while carrying wounded for 3-5. Even after months of therapy, he didn't regain complete use of the limb. Years after the war, I had the great pleasure of meeting and visiting with Senator Paul Douglas. I told him about the remark referring to him as the crazy old gray-headed guy. He laughed heartily and expressed great pride in having served with the 1st Marine Division. Each man in our detail took up a load of supplies bad Captain Douglas so long, and started back to the company lines. Other men went back to bring up the rest of the supplies before dark. We ate chow and finished preparations for the night. That was the first night on Peleliu that I was able to make a cup of hot bouillon from the dehydrated tablets in my K-rations, and a canteen cup of heated, polluted, oily water. Hot as the weather was, it was the most nourishing and refreshing food I had eaten in three days. The next day we got fresh water. It was a great relief after that polluted stuff. Dug in next to our gun pit were First Lieutenant Edward A. Hillbilly Jones, Company K's machine gun platoon leader, and Assault E Sergeant John A. Teskovich. Things were quiet in our area, except for our artillery's harassing fire pouring over. So after dark obscured us from Japanese observers, the two of them slipped over and sat at the edge of our gun pit. We shared rations and talked. The conversation turned out to be one of the most memorable of my life. Both Hillbilly and Teskovich were later killed. Hillbilly was second only to Akak in popularity among the enlisted men in Company K. He was a clean-cut, handsome, light-complexioned man, not large, but well-built. Hillbilly told me he had been an enlisted man for several pre-war years, had gone to the Pacific with the company, and had been commissioned following Guadalcanal. He didn't say why he was made an officer, but the word among the men was that he had been outstanding on Guadalcanal. It was a widespread joke among men in the ranks during the war that an officer was made an officer and a gentleman by an act of Congress when he was commissioned. An act of Congress may have made Hill Billy an officer, but he was born a gentleman. No matter how filthy and dirty everyone was on the battlefield, Hillbilly's face always had a clean, fresh appearance. He was physically tough and hard, and obviously morally strong. 
He sweated as much as any man, but somehow seemed to stand above our foul and repulsive living conditions in the field. Hillbilly had a quiet and pleasant voice, even in command. His accent was soft, more that of the deep south, which was familiar to me, than that of the hill country. Between this man and all the Marines I knew, there existed a deep mutual respect and warm friendliness. He had that rare ability to be friendly, yet not familiar, with enlisted men. He possessed a unique combination of those qualities of bravery, leadership, ability, integrity, dignity, straightforwardness, and compassion. The only other officer I ever knew who was his equal in all these qualities was Captain Haldane. That night, Hillbilly talked about his boyhood and his home in West Virginia. He asked me about mine. He also talked about his pre-war years in the Marine Corps. Later I remembered little of what he said, but the quiet way he talked calmed me. He was optimistic about the battle in progress, and seemed to understand and appreciate all my fears and apprehensions. I confided in him that many times I had been so terrified that I felt ashamed and that some men didn't seem to be so afraid. He scoffed at my mention of being ashamed, and said that my fear had been no greater than anyone else's, but that I was just honest enough to admit its magnitude. He told me that he was afraid, too, and that the first battle was the hardest, because a man didn't know what to expect. Fear dwelled in everyone, Hillbilly said. Courage meant overcoming fear and doing one's duty in the presence of danger, not being unafraid. The conversation with Hillbilly reassured me. When the sergeant came over and joined in after getting coffee, I felt almost lighthearted. As conversation trailed off, we sipped our joe in silence. Suddenly, I heard a loud voice say clearly and distinctly, You will survive the war. I looked first at Hillbilly and then at the sergeant each returned my glance with a quizzical expression on his face in the gathering darkness. Obviously, they hadn't said anything. "'Did you all hear that?' I asked. "'Hear what?' they both inquired. "'Someone said something,' I said. "'I didn't hear anything. How about you?' said Hillbilly, turning to the sergeant. "'No, just that machine gun off to the left.' Shortly the word was passed to get settled for the night. Hillbilly and the sergeant crawled back to their hole as Snafu returned to the gun pit. Like most persons, I had always been skeptical about people seeing visions and hearing voices, so I didn't mention my experience to anyone. But I believed God spoke to me that night on that Peleliu battlefield, and I resolved to make my life amount to something after the war. That night, the third since landing, as I settled back in the gun pit, I realized I needed a bath. In short, I stunk. My mouth felt, as the saying went, like I had gremlins walking around in it with muddy boots on. Short as it was, my hair was matted with dust and rifle oil. My scalp itched, and my stubble beard was becoming an increasing source of irritation in the heat. Drinking water was far too precious in those early days to use in brushing one's teeth or in shaving, even if the opportunity had arisen. The personal bodily filth imposed upon the combat infantrymen by living conditions on the battlefield was difficult for me to tolerate. It bothered almost everyone I knew. Even the hardiest Marine typically kept his rifle and his person clean. His language and his mind might need a good bit of cleaning up, but not his weapon, his uniform, or his person. We had this philosophy drilled into us in boot camp, and many times at Camp Elliot I had to pass personal inspection to the point of clean fingernails before being passed as fit to go on liberty. To be anything less than neat and sharp was considered a negative reflection on the Marine Corps and wasn't tolerated. It was tradition and folklore of the 1st Marine Division that the troops routinely referred to themselves when in the field as the raggedy-ass Marines. 
The emphasis during maneuvers and field problems was on combat readiness. Once back in the camp, however, no matter where in the boondocks it was situated, the troops cleaned up before anything else. In combat, cleanliness for the infantrymen was all but impossible. Our filth added to our general misery. Fear and filth went hand in hand. It has always puzzled me that this important factor in our daily lives has received so little attention from historians, and often is omitted from otherwise excellent personal memoirs by infantrymen. It is, of course, a vile subject, but it was as important to us then as being wet or dry, hot or cold, in the shade or exposed to the sun, hungry, tired, or sick. Early the next morning, 18 September, our artillery and 81 millimeter mortars shelled Japanese positions to our front as we prepared to continue the previous day's attack northward on the eastern side of Bloody Nose Ridge. A typical pattern of attack in our company, or any other rifle company, went something like this. Our two mortars would fire on certain targets or areas known or thought to harbor the enemy. Our light machine gun squads fired on areas in front of the rifle platoons they were attached to support. Then two of the three rifle platoons moved out in dispersed order. The remaining platoon was held in company reserve. Just before the riflemen moved out, we ceased fire with the mortars. The machine guns stopped also, unless they were situated where they could fire over the heads of the advancing riflemen. The latter moved out at a walk to conserve energy. If they received enemy fire, they moved from place to place in short rushes. Thus they advanced until they reached the objective. The mortars stood by to fire if the riflemen ran into strong opposition, and the machine-gun squads moved forward to add their fire support. The riflemen were the spearhead of any attack. Consequently, they caught more hell than anybody else. The machine-gunners had a tough job because the Japanese concentrated on trying to knock them out. The flamethrower gunner had it rough, and so did the rocket-launcher gunners and the demolitions men. The 60 millimeter mortar men caught it from Japanese counter-battery fire of mortars and artillery, snipers, who were numerous, and bypassed Japanese machine guns, which were common. The tankers caught hell from mortar and artillery fire and mines, but it was always the riflemen who had the worst job. The rest of us only supported them. Marine Corps tactics called for bypassing single snipers or machine guns in order to keep forward momentum. Bypass Japanese were knocked out by a platoon or company of infantry in reserve. Thus mortars fired furiously on the enemy to the front, while a small battle raged behind between bypassed entrenched Japanese and Marines in reserve. These Japanese frequently fired from the rear, pinning down the advance and causing casualties. Troops had to be well-disciplined to function this way, and leadership had to be the best to coordinate things under such chaotic conditions. Marine tactics resembled those developed by the Germans under General Erich Ludendorff, which proved so successful against the Allies in the spring of 1918. If the riflemen hit heavy opposition, our 81 millimeter mortars, artillery, tanks, ships, and planes were called on for support. These tactics worked well on Peleliu until the Marines hit the mutually supporting complex of caves and pillboxes in the maze of coral ridges. As heavy casualties mounted, the reserve rifle platoon, mortarmen, company officers, and anybody else available acted as stretcher bearers to get the wounded out from under fire as fast as possible. Every man in Company K, no matter what his rank or job, did duty as a rifleman and stretcher bearer on numerous occasions on Peleliu and later on Okinawa. Shelling from the ridge positions on our left slowed us down. Our planes made airstrikes and our ships and artillery attacked the ridges, but Japanese shells kept coming in. The company had an increasing number of casualties. 
We moved our mortar several times to avoid the shelling, but the Japanese artillery and mortar fire got so heavy and caused such losses to the battalion that our attack was finally called off about noon. On our right, 2-5 made better progress. That battalion moved forward through thick jungle, shielded from enemy observers, then turned east and moved out onto the smaller prong of Peleliu's lobster claw. We moved behind 2-5 eastward across the causeway road to exploit their gain. Again, shielded by thick woods, we moved away from Bloody Nose. We pitied the first Marines attacking the ridges. They were suffering heavy casualties. The word is that first Marines catching hell, said Snafu. Poor guys, I pity him, another man said. Yeah, me too but I hope like hell they take that damn ridge and we don't have to go up there, said another. That shelling coming from up there was hell, and you couldn't even locate the guns with field glasses, added someone else. From what we had seen thrown at us from the left flank during the past two days, and what I saw of the ridges then, I felt sure that sooner or later every battalion of every regiment in the division would get thrown against bloody nose. I was right. The first Marines' predicament at the time was worse than ours in 3-5. They were attacking the end of the ridge itself, and not only received heavy shelling from enemy caves there, but deadly accurate small arms fire as well. Being tied in with the first Marines at the time, we got the word straight from the troops themselves, and not from some overly optimistic officer in a CP putting pins on a map. The word passed along the line to us, told that when the men of 2-1 moved up toward the Japanese positions following pre-assault artillery fire, the enemy fired on them from mutually supporting positions, pinning them down and inflicting heavy losses. If they managed to get onto the slopes, the Japanese opened fire point-blank from caves as soon as our artillery lifted. The enemy then moved back into the caves. If Marines got close enough to an enemy position to attack it with flamethrowers and demolition charges, Japanese in mutually supporting positions raked them with crossfire. Each slight gain by the first Marines on the ridges came at almost prohibitive cost in casualties. From what little we could see of the terrain and from the great deal we heard firsthand of the desperate struggle on our left, some of us suspected that Bloody Nose was going to drag on and on in a long battle with many casualties. The troops got paid to do the fighting. I made $60 a month, and the high command, the thinking. But the big brass were predicting optimistically that the Japanese defenses and the ridges would be breached any day, and Peleliu would be secured in a few days, for nearly a week of bitter combat, Major General William H. Rupertus insisted that the 1st Marine Division could handle the job on Peleliu alone. Only after the 1st Marine Regiment was ground down to a nub, suffering 56% casualties, did Major General Roy Geiger, commander of the 3rd Marine Amphibious Corps, overrule Rupertus and order in the U.S. Army's 321st Infantry Regiment to help the Marines. As 3-5 moved eastward on 18 September, a buddy commented sadly, You know, Sledgehammer, a guy from the 1st Marines told me they got them poor boys making frontal attacks with fixed bayonets on that damn ridge, and they can't even see the nips that are shooting at them. That poor kid was really depressed. Don't see no way he can come out alive. There just ain't no sense in that. They can't get nowhere like that. It's slaughter. Yeah, some goddamn glory happy officer wants another medal, I guess, and the guys get shot up for it. The officer gets the medal and goes back to the States, and he's a big hero. Hero my ass. Getting troops slaughtered ain't being no hero, said a veteran bitterly and bitterness it was. Even the most optimistic man I knew believed our battalion must take its turn against those incredible ridges. 
and dreaded it. Death Patrol As we moved toward the smaller lobster claw, Snafu chanted, Oh, them mortar shells are busting up that old gang of mine, to the tune of Those wedding bells are breaking up that old gang of mine. We halted frequently to rest briefly and to keep down the number of cases of heat prostration. Although not heavy, my pack felt like a steaming hot wet compress on my shoulders and upper back. We were sopping wet with sweat, and at night or during a halt in the shade, our dungarees dried out a bit. When they did, heavy white lines of fine powdery salt formed, as though drawn by chalk along the shoulders, waist, and so on. Later, as the campaign dragged on and our dungarees caked with coral dust, they felt like canvas instead of soft cotton. I carried a little Gideon's New Testament in my breast pocket, and it stayed soaked with sweat during the early days. The Japanese carried their personal photos and other papers in waterproof green rubber pocket-sized folding bags. I liberated one such bag from a corpse and used it as a covering for my New Testament. The little Bible went all the way through Okinawa's rains and mud with me, snug in its captured cover. During one halt along a sandy road in the woods, we heard the words, Hot Chow, passed. The hell you say, someone said in disbelief. Straight dope, pork chops. We couldn't believe it, but it was true. We filed past a cylindrical metal container, and each of us received a hot, delicious pork chop. The chow had been sent ashore for Company K by the crew of LST-661. I vowed, if the chance ever came, I would express my thanks to those sailors for that chow. I fulfilled that vow in July 1945, after the battle for Okinawa ended. As we sat along the road eating pork chops with our fingers, a friend sitting on his helmet next to me began to examine a Japanese pistol he had captured. Suddenly the pistol fired. He toppled over on his back, but sprang up immediately, holding his hand to his forehead. Several men hit the deck, and we all ducked at the sound of the shot. I had seen what happened, but ducked instinctively with an already well-developed conditioned reflex. I stood up and looked at the man's face. The bullet merely had creased his forehead. He was lucky. When the other men realized he wasn't hurt, they really began to kid him unmercifully. Typical comments went something like, Hey, old buddy, I always knew you had a hard head, but I didn't know slugs would bounce off of it. You don't need a helmet except to sit on when we take ten. You're too young to handle dangerous weapons. Some people will do anything to get a purple heart. Is this the sort of thing you used to do to attract your mother's attention? He rubbed his forehead, embarrassed, and mumbled, Ah, knock it off. We moved along a causeway and finally halted on the edge of a swamp, where the company deployed and dug in for the night. Things were fairly quiet. The next morning the company swung south, pushing through the heavy growth behind a mortar and artillery barrage. We killed a few Japanese throughout the area. Late in the day, Company K deployed again for the night. The following day, Company K received a mission to push a strong combat patrol to the east coast of the island. Our orders were to move through the thick growth onto the peninsula that formed the smaller claw and set up a defensive position at the northern tip of the landmass on the edge of a mangrove swamp. Our orders didn't specify the number of days we were to remain there. First Lieutenant Hillbilly Jones commanded the patrol, consisting of about 40 Marines plus a war dog, a Doberman Pinscher. Sergeant Henry Hank Boys was the senior NCO. As with all combat patrols, we were heavily armed with rifles and BARs. We also had a couple of machine gun squads and the mortar squad with us. Never missing an opportunity to get into the action with his cold steel, Sergeant Haney volunteered to go along. 
G2, Division Intelligence, reports there are a couple thousand Japs somewhere on the other side of that swamp, and if they try to move across it to get back to the defensive positions in Bloody Nose, we're going to hold them up until artillery, airstrikes, and reinforcements can join us, a veteran NCO said in a terse voice. Our mission was to make contact with the enemy, test his strength, or occupy and hold a strategic position against enemy attack. I wasn't enthusiastic about it. We picked up extra rations and ammunition as we filed through the company lines, exchanging parting remarks with friends. Heading into the thick scrub brush, I felt pretty lonesome, like a little boy going to spend his first night away from home. I realized that Company K had become my home. No matter how bad a situation was in the company, it was still home to me. It was not just a lettered company in a numbered battalion, in a numbered regiment, in a numbered division. It meant far more than that. It was home. It was my company. I belonged in it and nowhere else. Most Marines I knew felt the same way about their companies in whatever battalion, regiment, or Marine division they happened to be. This was the result of, or maybe a cause for, our strong esprit de corps. The Marine Corps wisely acknowledged this unit attachment. Men who recovered from wounds and returned to duty nearly always came home to their old company. This was not misplaced sentimentality, but a strong contributor to high morale. A man felt that he belonged to his unit and had a niche among his buddies, whom he knew and with whom he shared a mutual respect, welded in combat. This sense of family was particularly important in the infantry, where survival and combat efficiency often hinged on how well men could depend on one another. During and after the war, army men told me that if a soldier got wounded and later returned to infantry duty, there was little chance it would be to his old company. They all agreed that was regrettable. They didn't like the practice, because a recuperated veteran became just another replacement in a strange outfit. We moved through the thick growth quietly in extended formation, with scouts out looking for snipers. Things in our area were quiet, but the battle rumbled on bloody nose. Thick jungle growth clogged the swamp, which also contained numerous shallow tidal inlets and pools choked with mangroves and bordered by more mangroves and low pandanus trees. If a plant were designed especially to trip a man carrying a heavy load, it would be a mangrove with its tangle of roots. I walked under a low tree that had a pair of man-o'-war birds nesting in its top. They showed no fear as they cocked their heads and looked down from their bulky stick nest. The male saw little of interest about me and began inflating his large red throat pouch to impress his mate. He slowly extended his huge seven-foot wingspan and clicked his long hooked beak. As a boy, I had seen similar man-o'-war birds sailing high over gulf shores near Mobile, but never had I seen them this close. Several large white birds similar to egrets also perched nearby, but I couldn't identify them. My brief escape from reality ended abruptly, when a buddy scolded in a low voice, "'Sledgehammer, what the hell you staring at them birds for?' you going to get separated from the patrol, as he motioned vigorously for me to hurry. He thought I'd lost my senses, and he was right. That was neither the time nor the place for something as utterly peaceful and ethereal as bird-watching. But I had had a few delightful and refreshing moments of fantasy and escape from the horror of human activities on Peleliu. This ends Disc 4.